Hello, hello. Welcome to Effective Cannabis Conversations, where cannabis coaches, educators, medical professionals, scientists, pharmacists, and patients come to share their knowledge and experience to educate on the health benefits of medical cannabis. Today, we'll be diving into the topic of bone and joint pain and how to utilize cannabis. Joining me for today's conversation is colleague and ECN advocate, Dr. Demetria Bates. Hi, Demetria. Welcome and thank you. Yes, thank you. Hello, hello to everyone that's out there. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, and thank you, Debbie, for you know having me on um, as the guest editor today. So would you just take a few minutes and introduce yourself and give everybody a little bit of background about who Demetria Bates is? Well, I am Dr. Demetria Bates. I am a nurse practitioner. I have my doctorate in nursing practice. I am the owner of Bates Virtual Health and Consultants, which provides uh, cannabis education consults, as well as medical cannabis uh, consultations. So I do provide those services for Virginia. So if you need, you know, like your medical card, you can definitely um, go to my website at www.batesvirtualhealth.com. Also, I am a veteran, uh, was an Army vet. I was in, in the Army for eight years, and I got out as a sergeant. Um, I am a can of mom, so I do have a toddler, and I am, you know, my lovely wife um, as well, so I am married, and other than that, I just love to have fun. I love to talk about cannabis and just have a great time. I love all of the things that you're doing. I think you're so inspirational working in the medical field or in some realm of medicine since you were like 16, I think. Is that correct? Yes, I started out as a receptionist, um, actually working in Petersburg, Virginia. I remember it till this day. It just was a little clinic. It's not there anymore. Um, but yeah, was working as a medical receptionist. And so, and you took that with you into the military, correct? Um, yes, I became a, at that time, it was a 91 Bravo, so a combat medic, but now they go by 68 Whiskey, um, which is mainly more equivalent to like an EMT, um, just so that everyone can kind of understand um, or kind of can relate to what that means. And so when you got out of the military, is that when you made the decision be, to become a nurse practitioner? No, actually, um, I ended up becoming being a registered nurse first, you know, because you do have to have that degree um, prior to becoming a nurse practitioner. Um, so I went to Bon Secours. At that time, it was Bon Secours Memorial College, but, um, but now they're more like a, a university in a sense. So I was, I'm excited um, to enhance uh, my journey by becoming a nurse practitioner when I went to Liberty University. Um, and I graduated there in 2018 uh, with my doctorate of nursing practice and my family nurse practitioner. So I am board certified through the ANCC. So how did you discover in all this process, how did you discover the medical cannabis and the role that it could play for you as a practitioner? So um, when it comes to, I guess, myself coming to the coming into the medical cannabis space, I would say when Virginia became legal um, back in 2021 is when I started my, my business, Bates Virtual Health in January. Um, it, it was just more of, I would say it's the, was the really the pandemic, um, you know, seeing people having like all this anxiety, um, you know, and they were like, I never had this anxiety before, but now they have anxiety. So now it's more of prescribing other medications, you know, whether it's hydroxyzine or now you with the Xanax or the lorazepam or any of that stuff. And then it was the opioid, you know, epidemic. So a lot of painkillers prescribing a lot of hydrocodone or this, that, because, you know, everybody, they've been in the house, they've been sitting, you know, in pain, um, just trying to figure out <laughs> how to navigate this new world, um, being enclosed. And even with myself, you know, when it came down to the pandemic, 
and actually being out there, you know, in the forefront, you know, going to work, because obviously I was one of those essential workers, so I had to go to work. But then, you know, that was my own anxieties and different things that I had to deal with. Um, so that's when it was like, no, it has to be something better than prescribing a lot of these controlled substances or even just the antidepressants. You know, it has to be something better. And like I said, once Virginia became legal, it was like, okay. And I'm just an open minded person that I wanted to, you know, look into this because, you know, growing up, it was always told to me that it was wrong. You know, cannabis is wrong. Can you explain to us? First and foremost, are you, you are you a medical cannabis patient yourself, and does that help guide you in helping others by understanding how it works for yourself? Um, no, I'm not a medical patient, um, just because I live in a pro-hip state in North Carolina, so, you know, recreational and medical is illegal here, so no, I'm not a, a medical cannabis patient. However, here in uh, North Carolina, you know, there is access to THCA which, you know, some people may know about THCA. Once you heat it up, you know, it definitely can convert over to THC. And is there an opportunity that you see that it's going to become legal in your state anytime soon? Um, when it comes to, I think it's called SB3, the uh, Compassionate Care Act that they have here in North Carolina, um, it is, you know, sitting on the table, but as far as it moving forward and being pushed, nothing is um, being seen of that currently. And I mean, I've even reached out to, you know, NC uh, Normal, and I haven't heard anything back from them either. So, like I said, it's definitely a pro-hip state. It might take a while, but I would love to see it, you know, happen. And I mean, a lot of people, they they are excited and they are hopeful. Um, and I meet myself, you know, I'm hopeful and praying that it does come through. Um, because, you know, with my education and actually working in Virginia, hopefully I'll, I'll be at the forefront to be a valuable resource, you know, here in North Carolina when that does happen. So I think that's very interesting that you're working in uh, Virginia and actually helping patients and providing them with relief and helping them determine how to apply um, cannabinoid therapies to improve their health. But then you live in a state that it's not available. So do you find that people are approaching you in your state that you live in looking for help? And how do you kind of direct someone? Because, you know, we do have still quite a few states that are not legal. I would say I haven't really been, you know, like I said, in the forefront or actually I, I have, let me say this, I have been networking and talking to people and going to like networking events. And I would say a lot of them have gravitated to me. They were like, wow, you know, you do this. I can't believe that. And so I just give them the information, you know, I let them know, hey, I can still educate about it. You know, no, I can't do any recommendations or anything, but I can still come to, you, you know, your facilities or your practices and, and talk. And, you know, I haven't had any, you know, of course, it's good feedback, but I haven't hit, had anyone to really bite on it just yet to say, yes, please come and talk to us about it. So I think I just putting out like little fillers, you know, just kind of little teasers like, hey, you know, I can definitely do this. Um, we can talk about it. You know, they are excited for it. They don't know anything about it because Delta 8 is still legal here, you know, so I definitely know the education is is needed for sure. And I think that's really important there because I think that education is what is needed. And that's why we work together as to make sure that we're educating worldwide, not just in the U.S., about the benefits of medical cannabis. But um, how would you, I guess, how do you approach that education uh, with someone that is a doctor or a practitioner in your state or do you? I haven't had to really, you know, talk with, you know, doctors or, you know, nurse practitioners or any kind of really healthcare professional. With me, I'm just going to be open about it, um, regardless of whatever your title is, you know, even if you are in the medical field or not, I'm just going to let you know, you know, yes, I am a certified cannabis health coach. You know, I do specialize in cannabis medicine and I work, you know, all my work is done in Virginia. And if they're open to it and they talk to me, hey, we can have that conversation. And if they're not, hey, I still plan a seed and I have to continue to move on. 
Thank you for being that open. I think that's what we needed. And I think that's what's needed in our society is for us to see medical practitioners that have had the medical training that also understand cannabis to be open about it because that's when we're going to start changing the mindset. So thank you for doing that. So we're here today to talk about joint and bone pain. And so could you just give a little description of what are some common causes of joint and bone pain? Well, of course, you know, wear and tear. People may have had fractures or different injuries. You know, those are the most common things, you know, that do happen. Um, and then, of course, you know, osteoarthritis. You know, then you got like rheumatoid arthritis. You have people who have fibromyalgia. You have people that may even have Lyme's disease. But then there's like un uncommon things, too. I know you haven't asked that, but uncommon things would be more of like just depression, you know, anxiety. Um, can definitely st cause some bone pain or muscle pain or whatnot, joint pains. I think that's an important part where you talk about the uncommon things, because I think when people have depression, they don't really relate that to their pain. So could you explain that just a little bit? Well, I can only speak for myself. Um, when it comes to, you know, dealing with depression and anxiety, it, it just really does feel like you know, people, most, a lot of people may say, you know, I feel like I got like a heavy burden on me. And it really does. It feels like heavy weights are on you sitting on your chest. I don't care if it's your shoulder. I mean, even with my knees, well, with my knees, I had surgery. But still, <laughs> it just, the pain just, I think the depression and anxiety makes it worse. Regardless of where those other joint pains may be, it just exacerbates it and makes it worse. And is that due to the way their our endocannabinoid system works? Yeah, um, because I, I feel like a lot of research of things that I have seen um, or read about um, is just showing more of like a kind of an endocannabinoid deficiency, especially like a lot of our anandamide is what they're finding. Um, and two, you know, all that inflammation within our bodies is what's causing a lot of our pain. And then when you have that anxiety or you have that depression and, you know, you, you don't want to move, you know, so you're like laying down for long periods of time or you don't want to get up and do certain things. So that physical component, that physical activity component is lost. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you don't move, move it, you're going to lose it type situation. <laughs> very much. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about the common things, which we don't see that cannabis cures these common conditions. What we see is it helps alleviate the symptoms. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, um, because based on like it's the mechanism of action, the way uh, cannabis pretty much works in the body, it's, you know, a lot of these bone and joint pain conditions is because of inflammation and even like uh, like neuropathic type pains too. Um, so with cannabis having that anti-inflammatory, also neuroprotectant uh, therapeutic benefits, that's how, you know, cannabis really can help those who are suffering from these conditions. And are there certain cannabinoids therapies that you can use to deal with that uh, inflammation? Are there specific things that you can talk about that would be some, give someone some guidance on where maybe they might start if they're struggling with any of those conditions? Well, I would definitely um, more recommend, and once again, I'm kind of talking to myself, speaking from my own experience, uh, even, C, you know, it's just starting off with CBD. You know, people are so worried about uh, you know, getting high or having that euphoria. So just start with CBD because CBD doesn't, you know, have that uh, intoxicating effect. Um, topicals, you know, just starting off with topicals would also be something that, that I would recommend. Um, but for me personally, I would have to say CBDA. So more of the acidic form or the precursor to CBD actually works wonders. And I find that I don't have to take as much CBDA as if I had to take a lot of CBD, if that makes sense. And I find that myself, and I think that's an important point to make, is explain a little bit about how CBDA works and how to consume it. Okay. Well, with CBDA, just like with CBD, you know, it basically 
attached to our receptors because our receptors do have, I mean, our cells, excuse me, our cells have receptors on them. And I mean, I know we talk about the endocannabinoid system being more like a lock and key. So with like CBD, CBDA, what it does, it attaches to our cells, to those receptors, but it helps us to, um, helps those receptors from pretty much stop them from like breaking down. And that's meaning so that our own natural molecules, such as like anandamide and the 2-AG can definitely stay in our bodies much longer. And those, you know, compounds that I'm mentioning are actually natural. So our body makes these endocannabinoids that helps us to feel better and whatnot. And so what CBD does, it helps like I said, to stop those enzymes from breaking those ones down. But then also too, the CBD, CBDA can also attach to other like non-endocannabinoid type receptors that can help us when it comes to, you know, our mood or our pain or whatnot. And we also see that there are other cannabinoids that do have anti-inflammatory uh, properties, uh, like mm -hmm. CBG is a very good mm -hmm. one for that. And THC yeah. also has some anti-inflammatory properties. Exactly. So um, it's just making sure that you're finding the right therapies for yourself. And um, how would you kind of guide someone in determining that, if you don't mind answering that? Okay. So when I look at CBD versus like THC, when it comes to like pain, um, I would say CBD is more, I feel like it is like what's helping to maintain me throughout the day, helping to keep my inflammation down um, because it's something more really more like a multivitamin that I definitely need to definitely take every, every day. But when it comes to THC, and like I said, speaking from my own experience, that's something I don't have to take every day. You know, it just all depends, one, on your endocannabinoid tone. So it's definitely individualized. But with THC, I feel like it helps to distract me from the pain, but it's also helping with the pain, too. It's like I can I know that the pain is there when I take THC, but then it's like, no, it's there but it's not there it's it's very interesting <laughs> i mean like i say yeah you might have to try to understand what i'm saying but it really is more yes a distraction but it's still helping because it has anti-inflammatory properties and as well as you know it's an analgesic to help with the pain well and i would think that from my own experience i can speak from this that when i use thc it gives my mind a break it yeah. gives my mind the ability to relax from thinking because I live with chronic regional pain syndrome, which is considered one of the worst types of pains that you can have. That's what they say. I don't know. For me, it's the worst. And um, just getting my mind to not constantly keep repeating this hurts, this hurts, this hurts, that THC allows me to have that freedom to be have a break from that for a period of time. So it really is called a break. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thank, thank you for actually putting it, you know, in that light, because truly the way you explained it is, you know, how, how I feel is like, yes, thank you for that distraction. You know, thank you that I, I'm not in pain. I don't have to like really think about that, but then also thank you, THC. Thank you, cannabis for, you know, decreasing that inflammation, which is causing that pain. And now thank you for decreasing my pain or even maybe alleviating it. It just all depends on your situation. And I think it's important to also point out here, because you were talking about it helping with depression and anxiety. Um, and that's a different effect uh, when we're talking about that. Could you explain that a little bit? So for depression and anxiety, um, it's definitely more of the terpenes for me. Um, yes, you know, CBD is a great uh, mood booster, but if I actually know the terpene profile, I can definitely, um, you know, take a certain strand. Um, I would say for me, limonene, uh, it's, it's the best <laughs> as far as antidepressant and anti-anxiety. And like I said, speaking for myself, um, but if I was to take something that's uh, high in pinene or pinene dominant type strain, it may could increase my anxiety. Um, but when I'm, you know, in a depressed mood or sad or, you know, just not, you know, feeling that ve that good, I would definitely reach for more of a limonene dominant 
strain of cannabis. And I think it's really important to, to point out that, that just because there's a lot of cannabinoid therapies out there available, they're each individual to you. But when you're using limine, does, how, does, how, do you, how can you describe how that makes you feel, the pain relief that you get from it? Well, once again, I, I just start feeling better. Um, I'm able to literally get up, move around. I mean, just little things, you know, from sweeping the floor or cleaning up the different rooms. Like I said, I have a toddler, so I'm definitely always bending, picking up, moving stuff around, you know, to keep him safe, but also to move all of his clutter out of the way. Um, you know, I, I can, you know, take my dog for a walk. So it just enhances me when, you know, I go for a walk, which is also a type of therapy, you know, when it comes to depression and anxiety, you know, they always say get out in nature. And I can tell you, I've never was a nature person. But once I started consuming cannabis, it actually enhanced that it improved that and I love going for walks now. And then I'm able to, you know, like you said, it helps you to clear your mind to clear your thoughts, you know, instead of like CBADZ, it actually puts it more in order like ABC. <laughs> And I think it's a beautiful experience when you are in touch with yourself, mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that cannabis does make you more in touch with yourself, and then it allows you to be more in the moment. I think that's an important part of um, cannabis that we don't talk about enough. Have you, can you give any examples where you've seen promise that cannabis is really a good treatment for that, whether it I would say definitely arthritis, and of course, based on, I think it was what Dr. Uh, Ethan Russo and his um, hypothesis when it came to the endocannabinoid deficiency um, for those who have like fibromyalgia, migraines, and IBS. Um, I don't, I have um, dealt with IBS, and I also have, you know, deal with migraines too. Um, but I know other people or other clients I've dealt with that has fibromyalgia, and I definitely can see where that is true. So yes, with definitely arthritis. Um, and even like just like with my dad, I, I can be honest, he had like a, a Achilles tear or rupture. Um, and I made him like a topical a infused topical bomb of like CBD um, with no, no THC in it. And just him rubbing that on it works wonders. <laughs> you know, he, he can say, you know, he has more movement now. It's definitely more flexible. Even when walking, I don't see him walking with a limp, you know, because uh, then I could, when he does that, I know, oh, well, he's probably in pain and he's hurting. Um, so, no, I, I feel like it can work in so many different um, bone and joint issues, but I just know the plant can help in so many different ways. I know we even mentioned a lot of them from anxiety, depression, and so on. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to like just pinpoint one thing um, because I feel like I could now like list over 50 plus medications for all these bone and joint pain issues than, um, like I said, other medical conditions. Um, but then when you say uh, cannabis, it's just one thing that I'm saying that can actually help with a lot of symptom relief for a lot of med uh, medical conditions. You, I need to unpack a whole lot of what you just said there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that information. First and foremost is, can you talk a little bit about just using topicals when you have arthritis and the benefit of using them and how it engages with your pain? Okay. Well, with topicals, I would say you don't have to worry about, it, you know, getting high from topicals. It's nothing that's going to cross the blood brain barrier or anything. So topicals is always a safer choice. Um, when using topicals, I would say, you know, you definitely have to rub it in um, really well, just because um, CBD, THC, a lot of them are fat loving, um, in a sense. So when it comes to it trying to cross into the dermis, which is just a, a, a layer of your skin, you just, because you got to think about it, your skin is a protector too, you know, it's a, it's a barrier in itself. So make sure you're massaging it. There's nothing wrong with a massage, you know, so in, enjoy it, you know. Um, so that you can get the medicine to where it needs to be. I would say, though, if your pain is really deep or, you know, more than an inch deep, you may have to do some dose layering. You know, you may have to take a little bit of 
uh, oral uh, ingestion, or you may have to inhale um, along with your topical. Um, when it comes to your topical too, you may have to apply it more often. And that's, you know, and that's okay too. So at least that's something you can, you know, take around with you, have a little bit in your car, or your pocket or whatever, a little bit in, at your desk, if, if that's allowed, if you're in a legal state. Um, no, I think it's really good when it comes to different, like, especially like your joints, you know, knee pains for sure, hands, I would definitely recommend it there. Um, you know, you can even try it, you know, even with like shoulder pains is something. But I would say with topicals, you can't wait until you're at a 10 out of 10 to, you know, apply it. Um, I would definitely recommend, like I said, just a different avenue and then applying the topicals just to kind of give you a little bit more of immediate relief. Because usually it can take maybe up to, you know, 15 to 20 minutes before it really start working. I actually use topicals for my fibromyalgia and my osteoarthritis. Um, and I actually do use it on my shoulder joints. And one of the things that I find is that it works really well. And it's interesting for me that it, you know, I can do it for like three days and then my pain is gone and I don't have it anymore. And I don't continue to use it because I just would be flooding my receptors, I think. Mm -hmm. And once I start feeling the little bit of the tinge, then I start putting it back. Now, I'm a consistent user daily besides just topicals. So that's one of the things that helps maintain me, I do believe. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight on that. No, I'm glad you, you know, mentioned that because I've had a couple of people um, that I have, like I said, I've shared my uh, pain bomb with them. And they was like, I had this, you know, this back pain. And I know, you know, my friend, he he was using it because I know he plays baseball, you know. So I, I let him, you know, use it because he was like, this hurts and this joint hurts. And, you know, so I said, okay, here, go ahead and try it. But then, you know, their friend ended up taking it. And like I said, she was like, ah, I have some back pain. And that pain bomb that you had, she said it is spot on. She said I was able to go to sleep because she was like, you know, just tossing and turning. I wasn't able to, you know, lay down or, or get comfortable. And, you know, this person is a medical cannabis patient themselves. But it was interesting that even though, you know, whatever route that they were consuming, it wasn't really giving them that relief that they needed. And it was really my CBD infused um, pain bomb put it on and she was able to go to sleep. <laughs> well, and I so. think that's really important there to, to hone in on a little bit is that first off, that means you're doing a targeted treatment when you're mm -hmm. using a topical, you're targeting just that specific area versus when you're consuming either an edible, uh, a vape or smoking, however you consume it, that's overall into your system where you're using a topical that's very targeted. So if you're having more intense pain, you can actually just hone in on that area and try to improve it. And the other piece of that is sleep. If you're not, if you're not getting good rest, your bones and your joints aren't recovering through that process. They need you to rest well. So I think rest is a very important piece of that. Yeah. And my wife too, you know, she has, um, she plays roller derby. And so she's always, you know, falling down or getting busted up so you know with her her pains that she have even with the pain bomb um on her knees she was like yeah she just applied and she go right on to sleep i mean my dad um i i gave him some like i told you about his achilles uh, my mom you know with her she has a lot of neuropathy because she is a diabetic uh, so you know within her hands i don't know she rubs it on her leg because she's had a couple of fractures herself from falls um man I, I could it's a list <laughs> that I, I could definitely go on and, and and say but just knowing that I can see the reward and one truly being open-minded to cannabis um for you know with all of its therapeutic benefits and being able to truly help other people is like I said, it's definitely a reward. And in the, the main reward is just knowing that I'm I'm walking in my purpose or I'm working in my purpose to help others. And so now let's talk about pharmaceuticals in this room and people that are using, there's a ton of pharmaceuticals that are prescribed for someone, especially with um, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, uh, fibromyalgia, 
there's just a, a, a whole ton of pharmaceuticals that are prescribed for that. How do you guide or recommend someone to maneuver through that process? Is it okay to use cannabis along with those pharmaceuticals? Is there certain things that they need to know about before they even venture there? Is there a place that they could look for information? Whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to guiding people, usually a lot of people are saying, you know, they take a lot of uh, like a leave and they take a lot of, you know, Tylenol is usually like the recommendation when it comes to people that have arthritis um, and whatnot. Now, when you start saying that you have, you know, other chronic pain syndromes, all of that, then you go into, you know, the opioids or more controlled substances. So as a way to, to truly guide them is, you know, one, letting them know, you know, hey, well, actually al- allowing them to really talk in the sense of, what kind of side effects are you having from these medications? You know, really giving them that education, but allowing them to tell me what these medications is doing to them. Cause that's what I'm hearing the most is that I'm having a lot of side effects from these um, medications that have been prescribed to me. And whether it's, you know, having kidney issues because now they have uh, used uh, NSAIDs, a lot of NSAIDs, or now I'm constipated whatever, you know, the range may be, is now of, okay, now that we know this, what do you want to do about it? Because this is what I am going to recommend when it comes to cannabis. Because that's another thing too, is that people are looking for providers to, you know, really write that prescription to say, hey, take this two times a day, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, you now have control of your medicine when it comes to cannabis. So, this is what I'm going to, you know, recommend, whether it's, you know, CBD or one-to-one CBD and THC, you know, here it is. I will give them that education. And then I will say, hey, well, let's start this, you know, maybe you just want to try it on days that you are at home um, and you don't have to work. But if they're retired, most likely, you know, they're at home. And then just try it, you know, in the mornings when you're awake. So then you can know like, hey, this is how this particular recommendation made me feel and then kind of go from there and titrate it up so I know we always say you know start low go slow best advice ever start slow (laughs) start low yeah (laughs) Uh, for sure um so replacing pharmaceuticals with cannabis is that something that you see and you uh, have knowledge about that people are actually replacing pharmaceuticals with cannabis yeah no um most definitely um a lot of people who've been on trazodone trazodone is usually given for people you know for sleep um purposes um hydroxyzine i've seen you know a lot of people be able to get off of hydroxyzine which is kind of equivalent kind of like benadryl in a sense and um, it can be prescribed for those who have like anxiety or um, even maybe for sleep not usually but it can be Um, people who's on buspar once again if you're having like panic attacks anxiety you know um I've seen a lot of decrease, you know, and a lot of antidepressants along my clients that I've um, dealt with. And of course, a lot of opioids. Um, I've seen a lot of decrease and I also seen some of them to discontinue that. Um, I don't, in my practice, I don't, um, you know, if another provider, you know, prescribed their medications for them, I don't, you know, do any tweaking of that. I let that be between them and their provider because I'm not the one who prescribed it. But as far as helping to them to come off of it and weaning, yes, I can definitely, I don't mind giving them the recommendations for that. And then too, reminding them that, hey, you have to have the control of your medicine. I think that's a really important message that needs to be given there is that for me, I've eliminated 28 pharmaceuticals with cannabis and I've for my chronic pain, I lived looking at the clock and watching it, waiting to see when I could take the next pill because I had 12 hour windows. So I could only take it every 12 hours. And that's true of a lot of pharmaceuticals that people take for pain or for anxiety, depression. When can I take the next one? I'm not feeling so well. 
And so I think that that was one of the most freeing experiences of being able to actually take my medicine when I felt I needed it or actually to stay ahead of the pain and take it before the pain uh, developed. Uh, that's one of the things that I've learned to do is to actually stay ahead of the pain. So I actually consume four or five times a day and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's the thing that becomes a, an acceptance that you have to give yourself to understand that it's okay to do that because we have not lived with that acceptance within medication that we have to, that pharmaceutical medications because they're given to us. Even if you go pick up a Tylenol or an aspirin at the pharmacist, you can only take it every four hours. If you're taking and consuming cannabis, if you need it within <laughs> sooner than that four hours, it's okay to use it. It's not going to harm you and you will find the benefits. So getting a program in place for you that works for you and knowing when you should be dosing and just being aware of the situation in the moment and knowing, okay, I'm not feeling so great. I can feel it might be coming on. I need to go dose because once you, one of the things with pain, when you get it built up so extreme where it's bothering you, it is really hard to bring it back down uh, with traditional medicines. And so that's the beauty of cannabis. It actually allows you to have the freedom to take it and manage your pain, which is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing too, you know, it just all depends on your pain. You know, they always taught us when I was the RN, you know, pain was the fifth vital sign. You know, it's whatever the patient says is their pain. Well, now as an MP, it's like, yes, I do understand that, but there's definitely a lot more, you know, as a, as, on us now if we were to prescribe you these opioids you know because there's like the risk of um dependence and addiction and you know even overdose and death so yeah no i was like something has got to give it got to be something better out there and then keep prescribing these uh killer opioids and i'm like i said thankful for for the cannabis um when it comes back to the control issue is that's a, a, another just common complaint that uh i've i've heard is patients are saying to me well i know my body you can't tell me you know how this is affecting me and it's like no i can't tell you that so here's once again here's cannabis here's another option you can now control your medicine and now it's like now what do i do now i have control and they're not they're just not used to that um, and they were like, well, I just don't want to get out here and just do anything. And I was like, well, that's why you have me, you know, I can definitely help guide you. But then knowing that insurance cover that, then they're still leery of wanting to follow up in a sense, because then it becomes an increased expense for them. Um, so I do, you know, once again, I still try to meet my clients where they are. So I do, you know, allow clients to message me, allow them to, whether, you know, email or text and, and they can call me, you know, if it's just a, a one question, you know, hey, yes, I don't mind answering. But if it do become like five to 20 questions, yes, you need to definitely follow up. Um, but I do want people to really understand that, no, it's it's something about having control of of your own medicine because I'm honest I mean I'm human you know yes I may have you know the accolades the white coat and all this but I don't want to always take pills either you know I, I barely want to take a, a Tylenol if if I have to so no just control take control of your health that that's the message right there take control of your health and your own well-being if you're on 20 medications I'm not going to say I promise, I'm not going to put a promise out there, but I will say when it comes to cannabis, most likely, you know, just like Debbie has said, you know, you, you've heard her own testimony is that she was on so many, but even if you're on 20, my prayer for you is that taking cannabis, you can at least, you know, get off of five, even if it's not five, at least two, just to give your body a rest. You know, your your body really is designed to, to want to heal itself. But as we continue to just put all this other stuff, junk into our bodies, it's, it's just not good for us. And I will say, you know, cannabis really helped me to learn to be, 
to be present, to be more mindful, you know? So, yeah, I didn't mean to go on a tangent, but yeah, cannabis really did something to my overall well-being. <laughs> well, and I think anybody that uses cannabis will, and has found success with it would probably say that. I, I hear that story from nearly every interview or conversation that I have. That's not unique. Um, if you don't have a medical condition to treat or manage, you will not feel or experience what I do. Um, so, you know, that's the thing to keep in mind. If you're a perfectly healthy person, um, not saying that cannabinoid therapies are still not good for you because I think they help maintain, but you're not going to feel the same benefit if you don't live in chronic pain, don't have muscle pains, joint pains, you're not going to feel the that leave you or be alleviated. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about when you, you work with someone and then somebody, uh, some other provider is recommending them their pharmaceuticals. Do you ever get the opportunity to, to co-work with that doctor and determine how they could eliminate some of their pharmaceuticals? And that's, that is another issue too, is that a lot of my clients, I would say they, they, um, they don't want me to talk with their doctor um, because their doctor has that stigma or they judge them. Um, so I really try to create that safe space, that safe environment when they do speak with me. So let's take a moment and talk to those doctors. Okay. <laughs> because I think this is a really important message. I'm a medical, a trained medical professional myself. I, I came through this years ago as a medical lab technologist and I think that um, I went into medicine to make a difference in people's lives and make them feel better. And I assume that's why most people go into medicine. So how can we talk to doctors and how can we help our clients to talk to doctors so that they can understand the value of cannabis in treating their patients? Well, I would, you know, I would definitely say, you know, you kind of just have to be open with it, you know, and just have that conversation with the doctor um, and letting them know, hey, I am interested in medical cannabis or yes, I do currently consume cannabis and it is helping me with this. And no, I don't, you know, stand up for yourself, be an advocate for yourself in black. No, I don't want to, you know, take these prescribed medications. Um, and then when it comes to me as a provider talking to another provider, once again, I'm going to tell you, this is what I do. Um, this is what, you know, my stance in it. If you want the research, hey, I don't mind sharing it with you. And if you're not open to it, hey, once again, I planted that seed. Um, and then another thing, when it comes to patients, if that provider, you know, is judging you or, you know, has that stigma, there's nothing wrong with what we call, you know, getting a second opinion and also just getting a, a different uh, provider that is willing to help you or help guide you or, you know, just truly meeting you where you are because you want to use cannabis um, for treatments for your ailments. I think that's critical for where we are right now. I think that first and foremost, we need to be a partner in our health ourselves instead of just relying on someone else. But we also want a doctor that will partner with us. We want someone that sees that we know our body better than anybody else. There isn't any way around that. They don't live it, we do. And so we're trying to build a platform to where we can have partnerships in medicine and health. And that's what's critical here. And it takes everybody being open and honest because no one lives your life but you and no one lives your health but you. So be in charge of it. Learn to have that freedom. And that's one of the things we are not taught. And I hope that through these conversations, people walk away knowing that they have that ability and they should stand for that because it is your health. So, yeah. Oh, you definitely have to be a, a patient advocate, you know, yes, I'm a advocate for, you know, cannabis, um, for all of my cannabis clients, but yeah, you definitely have to sp speak up, you know, and just let them know, you know, like, no, this is my stance. And that's the thing, you know, it just kind of, once again, go back to that control issue, you know, it's all about, you know, control because we are in control. We have the power in the pen. We write that prescription. Here you go. Take it. 
hope you feel better. You know, you have a side effect. We have that control. Here's another pill, you know, to mask that side effect versus trying to truly figure out the underlying condition, what's, you know, really going on here and how can we, you know, heal it more in a nat more natural um, stance. And speaking of side effects, since you bring that up, <laughs> how many side effects have anybody come back and reported to you from using cannabis versus what they report from you from using pharmaceuticals? Mm. <laughs> Huh, now I have to think about this. Um, hmm. <laughs> Obviously, it's not that many. Um, but no, as I would, I would definitely say, you know, maybe increased heart rate. I would say that, or a little bit of paranoia, and that's once again they were kind of out there doing their own thing and not really taking heed to the recommendation. And I will also say not reaching you know, or following up with me. Um, but when they do, it's just like making a, a simple tweak in their regimen. And then they're like, oh, no, I'm fine. Um, but as far as like, even the, the side effects that we know of, you know, where it's, you know, a cough or dry eyes or any of that, nothing, you know, I don't have the whole, I have constipation issues. Um, I don't have this stuff don't make me feel, you know, it don't, because that's another thing when it came to, you know, antidepressants, it's like, I just, you know, I don't feel like myself. And I've, I haven't heard that when it came to cannabis. It's more of, wow, I feel more like myself. I'm able to do things. Um, so it's actually just in revert, like, I guess it's pretty much in, ver in reverse uh, when it comes to the side effects that you may say that you have with these particular antidepressants and opioids. But when it comes to cannabis, it's different. It's like, no, I actually have regular bowel movements or something. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, it's different when well, I think about it. And the reason I asked that question is because uh, when I was on so many pharmaceuticals, I realized as I was cutting them off that I was given something in at a later date to combat a symptom that was caused by one of the pharmaceuticals that I was given. I haven't had to do anything to adjust my dosing because I've developed something other than maybe come back down. I always say we're looking to reach that sweet spot when we're dosing with cannabinoid therapies. And once you go over that level, you'll know it. But if you knock it back down, that goes away. I don't have right. to add something else in to take care of that. And that was one of the most, I guess, eye-opening experiences that I had was that realizing that a lot of the pharmaceuticals I was on was due to pharmaceuticals I was given. And then I developed another symptom that needed to be treated. So for you, what is the difference between recommending cannabis as a treatment versus recommending a pharmaceutical? When it comes to, like I said, with cannabis, you you have more control of your medicine. Well, with prescriptions, it's basically, here you go, this is what it is, and it's like kind of like a hard stop. Or either, you know, now there's um, a, a new pill, you know, a new prescription that I can write for this. But when it comes to cannabis, you're still within that whole cannabis sativa realm where, all right, well, this strain, you know, caused this you know, issue with you or, you know, or um, when it came to dosing, you might just need to increase that dose. But as far as the ceiling of it, you know, it's just like Dr. Sulak said, you know, just don't be afraid to, to go all the way when it comes with cannabis, where when it's with prescriptions, it's more of, if I do continue to do this, it, we're building toxicity, you know, we're now on the verge of, um, causing a lot of unwanted side effects, um, potential for, you know, addiction, dependence, and death. But when you talk about cannabis, no one has died from that. So I think it's it's just more of you have more, le you have more options, you have more leeway, you have more to choose from truly with cannabis with less side effects versus prescriptions. 
And I would also think that in this realm, that when you're talking to someone about cannabis, you have an opportunity for more education, getting to know them and know about them versus when you're prescribing a pharmaceutical, it's just, here's the pharmaceutical, take it. How much education do we get? Right. When we get that pharmaceutical, we just read that pamphlet when we get home from the pharmacy and it tells us all the things to be aware of. But we, I personally never really had doctors go through I can remember when I started on OxyContin and uh, the doctors were prescribing it. We were asking, what are the side effects? What are the things we should be worried about? And the only message that we got is that it can cause constipation. Now, <laughs> we know that's not true. There's so much more that goes along with that. And if you just watch commercials on TV about drugs today, the list of side effects that can happen. Now that doesn't happen with everyone, but it can happen. I think the education piece is what's a difference between prescribing cannabis and a pharmaceutical. Oh yeah, no, um, you definitely hit the, you know, head on the nail with that because, you know, just thinking about, you know, my own parents and, you know, the different medications um, that they're on. And I, I can hear my dad now, he, I know he just recently got, you know, prescribed a new medication and he was like, I just read all the side effects. <laughs> he was like, why, why do you think I even want to take this? You know, like it makes me not want to take it after I finished reading everything. And it's like, he had to wait till he got home, like you said, to read all of that. Um, so no, that's obviously truly lacking within the healthcare space. Um, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up because usually we only get like 15 minutes with a client and we can only say, okay, hey, how you doing? All right, well, let, what's today's issue? And of course you want to give us all 50 issues and it's like, no, we got to break that down to what's like at least your main one and then just, hey, follow up with us in another three months or something. Um, so yeah, no, that is definitely important. You've worked in traditional and now you're working in cannabis. Can you just explain a little bit about how freeing that is for you as a practitioner and the benefit that you think that you can provide your clients? Well, I would, oh man, <laughs> it's so rewarding. Um, I, I love it um, because one, I am an independent nurse practitioner, so I do not have a collaborating physician, so I don't have to worry about a physician saying, no, you know, don't do this or don't do that. If anything, I can refer clients to the physician and they can, you know, handle some other issues if if that is needed. Um, but no, I, I enjoy it um, when it comes to just a, getting away from a lot of the politics, um, when it comes to working in medical clinics, um, to having your own, you can I definitely dodge a bullet with that. <laughs> And how do you approach insurance? Because I know this is a big issue that we're uh, transitioning from insurance taking care of you and paying for a lot of your medications and stuff versus now you're purchasing something that a lot of insurances will not recognize. How do you handle that? As far as insurance, since my business is um, basically, you know, just full on cannabis, um, no other um, services are provided. It is, you know, cash pay. Um, but hopefully, you know, if it does become legal and insurances start covering it, then I will have to, you know, just pivot with that. You know, I'm pretty easy going when it comes to, you know, moving with the times because, hey, you know, here we are with legalized cannabis, got to move with the times. Because I actually did have a client who was trying to get a, I made, I did create, that's the thing. I did create a super bill. That was the main thing. I created a super bill for them so that they could get their, you know, consult covered through their insurance, but then it got kicked back and it was, they was asking like all these other questions. And it was like the platform that I'm using is not even, you know, um, able to answer those questions because of the way that it's, you know, my, the platform that I use is, uh, or EHR that I use is designed. So that's why I kind of just stepped away from it because I was like, I, I could see this just being another stigma issue. And so in order to, you know, keep my sanity and not be upset, <laughs> I'll just, you know, kind of just hold off. And, and like I said, I'll just move with the times so when it, insurance accepts it. Hey, guess what? I will definitely offer that service to my clients. I think this is an important thing for us to talk about because cannabis mm -hmm. is not cheap. 
but neither are pharmaceuticals. So, you know, if you're, you know, paying for an insurance plan and then you're wanting to use medical cannabis, it's a choice. And it's a choice that you're making and an investment that you make in yourself. And that's how I approach this. It, you know, even if I buy a vape, which I, you know, I do a flower vape, but that's a medical piece of medical equipment for me. Mm -hmm. And when I see the benefit of what it has done for my health and what I have accomplished, it's an expense I'll pay every time over and over and over. So it's just changing your mindset and how you think about this. And I think that everybody wants to live their absolute best quality of life. And I can say hands down, cannabis has done that because for three decades, I lived a life I did not want to live. And doctors just gave up on me and said, there's nothing more we can do. You have five years. And that was eight years ago. And here I sat because I decided to try cannabis and walk out of that medical realm. And it has been truly life changing. So it's just understanding what you're looking for in life and taking charge of your health. Again, be your best partner in your health. Yeah. So do your um, insurance cover your consult visits at all or they uh, I guess, well i don't not. consult a cannabis coach since i am one <laughs> and an educator so i don't do that and i utilize my own medical training to help me guide me okay but you know i can tell you my doctors are not receptive to me i'm very open just like you are i'm very very vocal about my cannabis use because i've done something that no doctor could do I've given myself the ability to sit here without oxygen. I'm not in a wheelchair anymore and I don't need a 24 hour caregiver. So, you know, that is huge. And they said, those are things that would never happen. They do happen. If you invest in yourself and take the time, is it an easy road? No, I would not say it is learning to educate yourself about medical cannabis takes work. No one just goes in and picks up something. And if they do, and it works for the first time, that's great. But most of us have multiple health conditions, not just one thing that we're treating. And that was the beauty of what came through for me is because I learned that I was started it for bone and joint pain, nerve pain, but then it ended up helping me with my lungs. And that is something I never expected. And it took me listening to my body to even recognize that that was happening. So it's a, it's a process, it's a journey. I call it a quest. So, you know, it's something that happens, but, you know, just be mindful that you're taking control of your health. You'll be in control of your medication. You'll be in control of what's happening on a daily basis. So I think that's all very good points. So what is your main stigma point that you still face? And as a medical practitioner and becoming an advocate for medical cannabis? Uh... I would say the main stigma is, you know, you know, you're, I would say what has been told to me by other providers is that you're just replacing, you know, another drug for, you know, another, basically, you know, addicting type drug. And I'm just like, no, cannabis, you know, is known as that. They're trying to say it's like a, a, gateway drug and it's like no it truly is it's an exit way um and i and i think it's just really because they have the lack of knowledge um most likely they have never tried cannabis ever and i mean i'll be honest you know like i say it, it's been taught to me that it was wrong for so long and i did you know i just touched the plant like last year but the main thing i was open to be educated about it and I think that's where the stigma when it comes to healthcare comes from, is that they don't know about it. They just like me, you know, they probably were in the DARE program. And then some doctors, you know, it's just, hey, stuck in their ways. And I've been doing this for 20 plus years. It's no need to, to pivot and, and think about anything else. Because since this work, you know, this way or the highway type situation. Um, as far as patient advocacy, I haven't really had um, any pushback from that. And that's just because, like I said, I'm an independent nurse practitioner and I don't have to really talk to any any doctors or other nurse practitioners or PAs. And I'm just truly just 
really open and honest about what I do uh, when it comes to cannabis. And and the funny thing about it is that I never really had that hesitation. Like once I started learning about cannabis, that's all I wanted to talk about. I mean, my friends can kind of vouch for that. They was like, D, you know, we never seen this vocal and you just light up, kind of have this aura around you. But yeah, no. And that's why I feel like I really am just walking in my purpose when it, and helping others when it comes to cannabis. I think that's uh, really cool because I get that all the time myself is like, you talk about cannabis all the time. It doesn't matter what conversation we get into, you somehow manage to bring that in. And it's like, it's because it's made such a difference in my life and it's such a powerful tool to take care of your health and you cannot help but feel I'm grateful for every day that I have. And it's because of cannabis that I'm living a life I never thought I would get to live again. And so, you know, when you have that experience, it's something you want to share because I believe everybody out there deserves to have the same information that I have or that you have or another cannabis coach or educator or medical professional has about cannabis. This is something that is not taught in our medical schools today. It is not taught in our pharmaceutical schools today. And why not? We were all born with a system called the endocannabinoid system. And it plays a role in everything we do. So we need to be educating about that. About to wrap up here, what is the one thing that I did not ask that you think that um, someone should know? I guess the main, the main question is, you know, most people want to know, what well, is it safe? <laughs> is cannabis safe? And with that, it, it, it's all about the education and actually knowing where you're getting your education from. Um, you definitely need to make sure, you know, it's a reputable source because um, I know social media right now is throwing out so many, you know, taglines and stories about, you know, cannabis and heart issues and stroke and, you know, yes, you know, cannabis and maybe even, you know, lung issues, whatever the case may be. Um, I would definitely say, yes, that is media, but truly, what is the research saying? I know a lot of people are saying, well, there's not a, enough research. I mean, you can go to Canakees. I mean, you can even come here, you know, to the Effective Cannabis Newsletter. You can reach out to certified cannabis um, health, you know, health coaches, even, you know, nurse practitioners that are actually doing, um, you know, the cannabis work or working in the cannabis industry. There is a lot of resources, you know, there's um, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, there's, you know, Dr. Raleigh Kirk, like, there's a lot of people out here, you know, not just myself. And, you know, if I don't resonate with you, there's definitely someone else, you know, out there, but we are here to advocate for you and give you that, the information that you need, so that you can make an informed decision, and most likely get off of those 20 pills that you're on. Yeah, very well said. <laughs> I think that we'll leave it there. I think you summed that up pretty well. I think that hopefully everybody walks away from today's show with some new information that they didn't have. Uh, we have a directory, and uh, if you'll check our website out or in our newsletter, there's always a link to the directory to people that are certified educators, coaches, and medical professionals that are working in this realm to help you. So the one thing about cannabis that I will say is that there's a, a vast array of information that's learned and, and we teach on, and there's someone out there for you, mm -hmm. regardless of what your health conditions are that can help you. So um, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you being here. And uh, Dimitri also shared her own personal story in this month's issue. So be sure and check it out and um, look forward to having you on again. Thank you. No, thank you. We so appreciate you dropping in. Your time and support are invaluable as we strive to educate and advocate for the transformative potential of medical cannabis. Remember, you have only one health and one life, and no one lives them but you.
Let's continue this journey together. Subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay updated on our latest conversations. Your comments and engagement fuel the dialogue we need to create change. Until next time, stay empowered and keep exploring the wonders of your endocannabinoid system. Stay uplifted, stay curious. Mm -hmm.